and is the destructive acts is in no way to deny the causal role of their earlier victimization and the need to address it, unquote. Patterson also contends that a cultural explanation of human behavior not only examines the immediate relationship between attitudes and behavior, but it also looks at the past to investigate the origins and changing nature of these attitudes. I strongly agree with Orlando Patterson that an adequate explanation of cultural attributes must explore the origins and changing nature of these attitudes going back decades, even centuries. But unfortunately, such analyses are complex and difficult. For example, it took years of research by my former student, Catherine Neckerman of Columbia University to provide the historical backdrop to explain why so many black youngsters and their parents lose faith in the public schools. She shows in her brilliant book, Schools Betrayed, that a century ago, when African-American children in most northern cities attended schools alongside white children, the problems commonly associated with inner city schools were not nearly as pervasive as they are today. Neckerman carefully documents how and why these schools came to serve black children so much more poorly than their white counterparts. Focusing on Chicago public schools between 1900 and 1960, she compares the circumstances of blacks and white immigrants, groups that had similarly little wealth and status yet received vastly different benefits from their education. Their divergent, divergent educational outcomes, she contends, were the result of systematic decisions made by Chicago officials to segregate schools and deny equal resources to African-American students in an effort to deal with the increasing black migration to the city. These decisions reinforced inequality in the schools over time. Ultimately, she points out, these actions eroded the school's legitimacy in the lower class black community and dampened aspirations for education. Quote, the roots of classroom alienation, antagonism, and disorder can be found in school policy decisions made long before the problems of inner city schools attracted public attention, unquote, states Neckerman. Quote, these policies struck at the foundation of authority and engagement, making it much more difficult for inner city teachers to gain student cooperation and learning. The district's history of segregation and inequality undermined the school's legitimacy in the eyes of its black students. As a result, inner city teachers struggled to gain cooperation from children and parents who had little reason to trust the schools." Unquote. We, meet, we need more studies like this to fully understand the current cultural dynamics in inner city neighborhoods. The use of a cultural argument, however, is not without peril. Anyone who wishes to understand American society must be aware that explanations focusing on the cultural traits of inner city residents are likely to draw far more attention from policymakers and the general public than structural explanations will. It is an unavoidable fact that Americans tend to de-emphasize the structural origins and social significance of poverty and welfare. In other words, the popular view is that people are poor or on welfare because of their own personal shortcomings. A 2007 survey by the Pew Research Center revealed that, quote, fully two-thirds of all Americans believe personal factors rather than racial discrimination explain why many African Americans have difficulty getting ahead in life. Just 19% blame discrimination. Nearly three-fourths of U.S. whites, a majority of Hispanics, 
and even a slight majority of blacks believe that blacks who have not gotten ahead in life are mainly responsible for their own situation. If the views of blacks on this issue are surprising, consider my former student Alfred Young's study. Young is now a professor here at the University of Michigan. He found in his impressive study of how inner city black men perceive opportunity and mobility in, in the United States, he found that although some men associated mobility with the economic opportunity structure, including race and class-based discrimination, all of these inner city men shared the view that individuals are largely accountable for their failure to advance in society. The strength of American cultural sentiment that individuals are primary, primarily responsible for poverty presents a dilemma for anyone like myself who seeks the most comprehensive explanation of outcomes for poor black Americans. Why? Simply because Cultural arguments that focus on individual traits and behavior invariably draw more attention than do structural explanations in the United States. Accordingly, I feel that a social scientist has an obligation to try to make sure that the explanatory power of his or her structural argument is not lost to the reader and to provide a context for understanding cultural responses to chronic economic and racial subordination. Consider, for example, the complex causal flow between structure and culture. In an impressive study that analyzes data from a national longitudinal survey with methods designed to measure intergenerational economic mobility, Patrick Sharkey of NYU, also one of my former students, found, I don't mind saying that, I'm proud of my former students, so you, have to, you, just, have to, you just have to put up with it, okay? <laughs> Sharkey, Patrick, Sharkey found, quote, that, that, quote, more than 70% of black students who are raised in the poorest quarter of American neighborhoods, the bottom 25% in terms of average neighborhood income, will continue to live in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods as adults. That's incredible. He also found that since the 1970s, a majority of black families have resided in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods in consecutive generations compared to only 7% of white families. Thus he concludes that the disadvantages of living in poor black neighborhoods like the advantages of living in affluent white neighborhoods are in large measure inherited. We should also consider another path-breaking study that Sharkey co-authored with senior investigator Robert Sampson of Harvard and another colleague, Stephen Roddenbush, that examined the durable effects of concentrated poverty on black children's verbal ability. They studied a representative sample of 750 African-American children ages 6 to 12 who were growing up in the city of Chicago in 1995 and followed them anywhere they moved in the United States for up to seven years. The children were given a reading examination and vocabulary test at three different periods. Their study shows, quote, that residing in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood cumulatively impedes the development of academically relevant verbal ability in children, unquote, so much so that the effects linger on even if these, even if these children leave these neighborhoods. The results reveal one, that the neighborhood environment is an important developmental context for trajectories of verbal cognitive ability. Two, 
that young African-American children who had earlier lived in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood had fallen behind their counterparts or peers who had not resided pre previously in disadvantaged areas by up to six percent, by, by up to six IQ points, a magnitude estimated to be equivalent to missing a year or more of schooling. And three, quote, that the youngest effects appear several years after children live in areas of concentrated disadvantage, unquote. And this research raises important questions about ways in which neighborhoods may alter growth and verbal ability, producing effects that linger on even if a child leaves a severely disadvantaged neighborhood, unquote. The studies by Sharkey and Sampson and his colleagues both suggest that neighborhood effects are not solely structural. Among the effects of living in segregated neighborhoods over extended periods is repeated exposure to cultural traits. And this would include linguistic patterns, the focus of Sampson et al. study that emanate from or are the products of racial exclusion, traits such as verbal skills that may impede successful maneuvering in the larger society. As Sharkey points out, and I quote, when we consider that the vast majority of black families living in America's poorest neighborhoods come from families that have lived in similar environments for generations, continuity of the neighborhood environment, in addition to continuity of individual economic status, may be especially relevant to the study of cultural patterns among disadvantaged populations, unquote. Unfortunately, very little research attention has been given to these cumulative cultural experiences, and it is sometimes difficult to separate cumulative cultural experiences from cumulative psychological experiences. Take, for example, repeated experiences of discrimination and disrespect that a lot of blacks share in common. If these experiences are systematic over an extended time period, they can generate common psychological states that some may interpret as norms because they seem to regulate patterns of behavior. Resignation as a response to repeated experiences with discrimination and disrespect is one good example. Parents in segregated communities who have had such experiences may transmit to children through the process of socialization a set of beliefs about what to expect from life and how one should respond to life circumstances. In other words, children may be taught norms of resignation. They observe the behavior of adults and learn, quote, the appropriate, unquote, action or response in different situations independently of their own direct experiences. In the process, children may acquire an inclination to interpret the way the world works that reflects a strong sense that other members of society disrespect them because they are black. Thus, in addition to structural inf influences, exposure to different cultural 